Thank you, Jeff and musicians. Great song. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, we'll be beginning at verse 7 in just a moment. We pick up this morning and, and uh, continue our study through this letter, the, the first letter of, uh, of John here. And our thoughts this morning will center around the fact that God is love. We'll just set the context very quickly in the first six verses if you were here last week, you understand that John warned us in those passages and those verses about false teachers in the world, and we pointed out that false teachers have been around since the Garden of Eden. Satan is the father of all lies. He deceived Eve, and so uh, from the very beginning, Satan has been at heart at work to deceive men and women uh, in, in the truth of God, and he really does that in two ways. For lost people, his main purpose is to continue to keep them blinded in their sins so they can't see the gospel and be saved. And so Satan works very hard to deceive the lost uh, so that the light of God's love doesn't shine into their life. And for those who are saved, Satan works very hard to uh, neutralize our effectiveness for, for the Father. In other words, Satan seeks to discourage us and, uh, and reduce our ability to serve God faithfully through false teachers and certainly attacks and various things in our lives. Uh, the good news is we discovered last week that we can tell the difference between true and false teachers by one thing. We just ask them what they think about Jesus Christ because true teachers preach the incarnation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that he's God. Uh, false teachers do not, and so there's your litmus test uh, to find out and determine if a teacher is true or false. John moves this week from warning us about false teachers uh, to talk about his favorite topic throughout this letter, and that topic is love. Now you'll find two things in this passage that we'll really take a, a look at this morning, and one is this. The greatest evidence, the greatest evidence in a person's life that they've been born again, that they have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, is that God is reproducing his love in them. In other words, we see in their life that they love God, they love the brethren, and they love the lost like God has loved them. That's the greatest evidence of being saved. The second thing you'll find out in this passage is that love is part of God's very nature. It's not something that he does. It's not just a characteristic. Love is who God is. And so we'll talk more about that in detail. But let's begin in verse 7. And notice uh, John begins here talking about the evidence of being saved connected to God's love. And he says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, he begins by saying uh, those who are born of God, the evidence that we are born of God is the fact that we love. Now, being born of God is connected to the new birth. Now, we understand, uh, those who are saved understand that when we come and uh, on that time that we confess our sin to God and place our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit did a supernatural work in us. He changed us on the inside. The Bible says we became a new creation in Christ. The Holy Spirit came to live in us. The evidence of that transaction, the evidence of that supernatural work taking place in our life is the fact that God begins to create his love in us, and we demonstrate that in our lives by, again, loving God, reciprocating his love, loving the brethren, those who are saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, and loving lost people. Uh, one of the greatest examples that I know of in life uh, of, of a man who who demonstrated the love of God in, in a most difficult situation uh, happened in the 70s. And uh, some of you will remember, if you're old enough, uh, when the Orange Park Mall opened, uh, it used to be cow fields there. It was a dairy there, and they built a mall there. And uh, right after the mall opened, of course, it was all the, all the rage, and everybody went there, and there were stores. And uh, a young lady and her friend went there one night, and when... The store was closing, they went to go home, and the young lady split up, and one of them was abducted, and she was murdered, and uh, the, the Clay County Sheriff's Office found the person who did this crime, they found her body, and then they found the person who killed her within a day or two, and he was in the jail down at, uh, in, our, in Green Coast Springs. Well, it just so happened that the father of the young lady was a pastor named Paul Estes, so it was a pastor's daughter who was abducted and murdered. And, and Paul went down to the sheriff's office and said, can I, can I go in and talk to this young man, the young man who killed his daughter? 
And of course, they had some apprehensions about that, uh, but they allowed him. They allowed him to go in and meet with this young man, of course, with supervision. And uh, Paul, of his own testimony, uh, talked about the pain of this man having taken his daughter, had killed her. But he went in. Here's, here's the demonstration. Here's the power of God in a man's life. Paul went in and sat down with this young man, and he said to him, what you did is a terrible thing. You took the life of a young lady who, uh, who was my daughter, whom I love very much. And he said, you took her life, and you committed murder, and that's a sin. And he said, but God loves you. And he tried to win that young man to Jesus. He shared the love of Jesus with him. He shared the gospel with him. Now, I use that example to say this. I thank God I've never been in that situation. I don't know if that would be my reaction, just to be honest. Matter of fact, I know what my reaction would be. Uh, I would just take God to overpower that. The point is, there is a demonstration. There is a real-life illustration of a man who allowed God the Holy Spirit in his pain and in his suffering and the loss of his daughter and sitting in front of the man who caused that pain and difficulty in his life and yet demonstrated the love of Jesus to that young man so that he might be saved. That is the evidence of being saved. That kind of love is the evidence of having been born again, those who were born of God. You see, people who aren't really saved can't love like that because you can't do that in the flesh. You can't have that reaction in the flesh. No, my flesh says, if I get within 10 yards of that fellow, he's going to know how unhappy I am. That's the flesh. No, but the Spirit of God produces in us, in Jesus Christ, the ability to love like God loves. The second thing he says here, not only is it that we who are born of God, everyone who loves God demonstrates that they're born of God, but they also demonstrate that they know God. And I want you to think about that. He didn't say that you know about God. He didn't say that we just have a knowledge of God, but that we know God. In the Greek, there are several words for, for gnosis, for to know. And some of them mean to have knowledge of, and some of them mean to know experientially. What John's speaking about here is an experiential knowledge. It means when we love like God loves us, we give evidence that we've had an experiential relationship with God, that we've personally met him and we personally know him. Now, you would agree there are many people in the world who know about God. There are many people in the world who know about the Bible academically, but it makes no difference in their life. They've never come to Jesus Christ confessing their sin and asked to be forgiven and born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't do that, but they know all about God. I've talked to many people who want to talk to me about the Bible. And they want to talk to me about God, and it's an academic exercise. You know, did the chicken or the egg come first? That kind of silly stuff. But they don't really know God. You know, John says when we love like God loves, he gives an evidence that we have an experiential knowledge of the Savior who loved us and died on the cross for us. So my question would be, just based on what John said in verse 7, can we measure our own lives? Do we love like that? Do we love people? Do we care about them? Notice what he said in verse 8 at the end, at, at the, in verse eight about love. He gives the opposite. He said, he who does not love does not know God. Well, that's pretty, pretty definitive, isn't it? In other words, he's saying those who exhibit no love like Jesus in their life, those who exhibit no change in their life, no inside change, no, cre no new creation, no love of God, don't really know God at all. I would suggest there are a lot of folks who... who profess to be followers of Christ, who are members of churches, but they don't have any evidence in their life that they know God or the love of God. Now, let's be fair about the reality of life. We don't all love always like we should, right? I mean, I, you probably don't struggle this, but, but my flesh gives me fits every day. And somebody makes me angry or is unkind to me or, or unkind to my family in particular, my wife or my children, makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up, you know, gets my gets my Georgia blood boiling and, and I want to, you know, and I want to let them know how unhappy I am. And sometimes, listen, the Holy Spirit grabs me by the back of the neck and says, knock it off, you know, and, and convicts me. And I, and I know that that's not the thing I'm supposed to do. And the Holy Spirit keeps me from being that way. But from time to time, I fail. And maybe you fail too, right? Well, here's the good news. If you're a, a true born again child of God, as soon as we fail, what happens? We're convicted. The Holy Spirit says, hey, hey, that's not how my children act. That's not, how, that's not how one who belongs to me is supposed to act. And so I get convicted about it. And then I confess it and tell God, you're right, and I'm sorry. And then I, and I move on. Here's the point. 
Loving like God loves should be the habit of our life. The failure should be the exception in life. Follow me? And when we fail, we confess and, and we move on and do what God told us to do. Now, that's the evidence of being saved. That's what love looks like when we're saved. Now he says something really important at the very end of verse 8. Look at it. He says, he who does not love does not know God. But now look at this part. For God is love. You see that? Now that's important. I want you to think about this with me. He didn't say love comes from God. He didn't say love is of God. Those things are true, but that's not what he said. He said God is love. That's more, listen, that's more than a characteristic or a trait or an element of God. What he's saying is that is exactly who God is, that God is in his nature, in his person, love. That's what he is. That defines him. He's love. In fact, in chapter 1 of this same letter, John said that, that God is something else as well. And I want to tie these two together. So I want to show you 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Listen to what he said. He said, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Same phrase. Not that light just comes from God. Not that light is just a characteristic of God. He said, God is light. And then in chapter 4, he said, God is love. Now I want to take just a moment and think about those two natures of God. Let's start with light. He said, God is light. What do we connect with light in the Bible? What does the Bible connect with light? Well, it connects purity and holiness and righteousness and justice, all the things that God is. Listen, not just characteristics of God, but it is who he is. Think about it. God is in his nature absolutely holy. God is in his nature absolutely righteous. God is in his nature absolutely just. That's what he is. That's who he is, not just a characteristic of him. Now, the opposite of light is darkness. And in the Bible, darkness is always connected with evilness and foulness and deception and gloom and sinfulness and wickedness. And so God is light means all sin and things are absolutely opposite or contrary to his nature, to who he is. And so Jesus could stand in the temple in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12, and say to all the people in there, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why could Jesus do that? Because he's God. And he stood in the middle of the temple and said, I am light. The truth you're looking for, the holiness, the righteousness, the change, the life that you're looking for, to be different, he said, it's me. If you follow me, if you come, you can walk in the light and not in darkness. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, he said something else. He said that Jesus Christ is the light that came into the world, and listen to this, and lights the heart of every man. It is the light of God shown into the world in Jesus Christ. Think about this. Of all the creatures that God created on this planet, human beings are the only ones created in his image. Dogs, cats, you know, I know you like your pets. They like you, Amen. but they're not created in the image of God. You are. You're created in the image of God. Now, here's the difference. Because you're created in the image of God, you can recognize that God is light, that he's holiness. You can recognize the nature of, of God. Why? Because you're created in his image. The cat and the dog don't know who God is. The horse, the giraffe, the anteater, they don't know who God is. They just do what they're created to do. They do what they have in their, in their nature. You, however, and I are created in the image of God, and we can see the light of God. We can understand his truth, and here it is. We're the only creatures on the face of the planet created in the image of God who can receive him, who can recognize it and say, God, you're right, and I'm wrong, and I want to be saved. I know this is, I get asked this sometimes. Your favorite chihuahua is not getting saved, okay? He can't come to Jesus. Your poodle, your, your horse, your, your cats, they don't get saved. Why? Because they don't recognize God. They don't understand who he is. They're not created in the image of God. Well, you are. So it's important that God is light in his nature, and he shines a light in the heart of every man so that you can be saved. If you're watching online this morning, you're here, and you've never been saved, do you understand right now, through the truth of God's word, he's shining the light of the gospel into your heart so you can be saved? All you have to do is receive it. All you have to do is say, God, you're right, and I'm wrong, and I want to be saved. 
God has given you the ability to be able to do that because he created you in his image. So God is light, but then he says God is love. Now that's even, to me, greater. Not only that God is, is a, a dispenser of love or that he's the source of love, he is, but God is in his nature love. And you know, the fact that God is love explains a lot of things that are hard to understand. Let me give you three of them real quick. Have you ever asked yourself, think about creation. Why would God create a universe? Now, granted, it's not really hard for him. He spoke and boom, there it is. So that's, I mean, that's pretty easy because he's God. But why would God create creatures, human beings, who are going to break his heart? Why would he create us knowing we're going to break his heart before we get here? Why would he, why would he create do all the stuff, put it here for us to live, all the resources, the air and the water and, the, and, and, and food and put everything here for us and put Adam and Eve in the garden and right out of the chute, first two people, not even had kids yet, and boom, they disobey him and they break his heart. Why would God do all that? You want to know what the answer is? Love. You see, think about this. Love, love wants to express itself. Love wants to, love wants to demonstrate itself. You don't keep love to yourself. You want to demonstrate it. You want to do stuff. I told the early service when I, I met Sherry when I was in high school in the ninth grade, and she was, I was going into tenth grade, and she was coming in the ninth grade. And when I saw her, and I said, I got to find out who that is. Matter of fact, I told my buddy in the youth choir, I said, I said who is that? And he goes, that's the, the music minister's daughter. I said, do you know her name? He said, no. I said, I'll find out today. So we, are, we were already planning but listen, when I figured out I loved her, it took me a few more years to convince her of the same, but when I figured out I loved her and I told her I was going to marry her, we were in high school and she said, you can't know that you're going to marry me. I said, oh, I know. And so when we got married, I said, see, I told you. <clears throat> it's 40 years now. But here's the point. When I, did, when I, when I loved her and, and have loved her, it's not enough to just say, I love you. And you know, the old boy who got married and he looked at his wife and he said, all right, I love you. And if it ever changes, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, that won't work because what do you do when you love somebody? You keep telling them. And not only do you say it, but words, when you say, I love you, the words will be hollow without action, right? Without some demonstration of the love. You want to spend time with them. You want to be with them. You want to build life with them. Do you understand when God created us like that? God is love in his nature. And he, and he wanted a lavish love on a creature that he created, so he created man, men and women. And God, God loves to demonstrate his love to us. He loves to keep loving us. Why? Because that's what love does. That's its nature. That's what it does. And because God is love, he just loves all the time. He just, he just lavishes love on us. Think about all the goodness of God. Even when we don't deserve it, love says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep loving you. And so God in creation, created man because he wanted a creature that he could love and have a relationship with, which leads to the next logical thing. God created human beings with a free will because of love. It explains it. Now, that's a hot-button topic. People go, well, you know, how can God be sovereign and create man with a free will? Well, love explains it. Listen to me. Unless love is a free choice, it's not love. Unless love is a, is a willing, voluntary reciprocation, it's not love. It's forced. It's a robot. God could have created us, and he could have said, <clears throat> you have no choice. You have to do everything I say, and he's God, and we would have had no choice but to do everything he says. But no, what God wants is for us to choose to love him back. And so God created us with a, 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 what I call a limited autonomy. Listen, listen to a quote. One writer said it this way. He said, love is of necessity, <clears throat> the free response of the heart. Think about that. Love is of necessity, a free response of the heart, not forced. Meaning we choose to love. We choose to love just as God chooses to love us. Listen to the rest of this. Love is a necessity, the free response of the heart. And therefore God, now listen, by a deliberate act of self-limitation, had to endow men and women with free will doesn't mean God's not sovereign that he gave us some level of free will, some, some degree of free will. No, it, it proves his sovereignty, and it proves who he is. God in his sovereignty chose 
to create a creature that can either accept or reject him. God chose to do that because he can, because he's God. And so out of love, God wants us to love him back. The greatest thing we can do as Christians after we get saved is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's it. And listen to me. If we do that, everything else will fall into place. The relationship in the marriage, the relationship with our children, everything else in life will come where it's supposed to be if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Which, by the way, was in the Shema, the first command to the Jews, hey, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. So love caused God to give us this degree of free will. And finally, number three, the fact that God is love explains redemption, doesn't it? How else can you explain that God would tolerate man's incessant rebellion, our hard-heartedness, and our continual pursuit of wickedness? How else can you explain that God would tolerate that other than love? He loves us. And he sent his son to die for us. He longs to restore us to a relationship with him. God wants to save the whole world. Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. I do not believe in a limited autonomy or limited atonement. There's a limited autonomy, but not a limited atonement. And by that, I mean God is willing to save everybody. The only reason everybody in the world is not saved is they won't come. They won't trust Jesus. They love their sin and they pursue wickedness. We've all been there. We've all been there before we were saved. You say, well, I wasn't as bad as I Some people, yeah, but you were still lost. We're all lost until we come to Christ. God wants to save the whole world, but men and women won't come. Matter of fact, Paul said men love their darkness more than light, and that's why they stay lost. Not because God can't save them, but because men love darkness. But God loves us, and that explains redemption. Why would God put up with us? Because he loves us. Why would God put up with our stubbornness and our sinfulness? Because he loves us. I've told all four of my children, you can disappoint me and you can disobey and I might be upset with you, but I won't ever stop loving you because love's not connected to what they do or what they don't do. They're mine. They're connected to me. They're my children and I'm going to love them. God does the same with us. He loves us. I would dare to go out on a limb and say, God's not always happy with everything we do, you think? God's not always happy with all the things we say and all the things we might do, but he loves us nonetheless. Why? Because he is love. Because that's what he does. Now, the ultimate demonstration of love we find in verses 9 and 10. Look at it with me. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The transcendent expression of love, the greatest expression of love in the universe is that God the Father would give his son, his only begotten son, the only born one, to die on a cross and pay for our sin. He did that out of love. He did it, and it was manifested toward us in that Jesus came in his incarnation. And he did it that we might have life and that we might live through him. Now let me point something out. Every human being has eternal life. Your soul is going to live somewhere forever, heaven or hell. So you have eternal life. You are an eternal creature, not just body, but who you are. Jesus died on the cross so that your eternal existence and mine can be with the Father, not in punishment, can be with God, not in judgment. So to have life that we might live through him means to have real life, not just here, but have life with God forever, which is the hope of life here. Jesus died on the cross to do that. Now, what did it take for all that to happen? Listen very carefully. God is just and holy and righteous. We talked about that. He's light. Now, God in his justice said he's going to judge all sin. And the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. So, from the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, I have to judge sin. But God loves us because he is love, and he wanted us to be restored to him. So what God did in his love is looked for a way to solve the justice problem, to solve the payment of sin. 
And the way that happened is Jesus Christ came here and paid for our sin. Now, because Jesus paid for the sin of the whole world, what did that do? It opened the way for God to pour his love out on us because the sin had been paid for. In other words, God's justice against sin was satisfied in Jesus Christ so that now we can enjoy the love of God unhindered. So here's what happens when you get saved. At the moment we confess our sin and by faith ask Jesus to forgive us, our sin is removed from our account forever. That's good news because we are justified, no longer under the condemnation of God. But not only does God remove our sin forever, but he places on us the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the light. Anybody who comes to me won't walk in darkness, but can walk in the light of life. Jesus puts his righteousness on us. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us so that now we can walk in the light. We can walk in the truth. We can walk with an understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit of the righteousness and the justice and the holiness of God. And in that, now we can experience the full love of God in our lives as we learn and understand the Bible and grow in sanctification. So it's very important to understand that God first paid for our sin, then to pour out his lavish his love on us so that we could receive it because justice demanded that sin be paid for. Now, all human love, all human love comes from God's love. Our relationships in our marriage, our relationships with our children, all is a type of the love of God for us. If we love God and reciprocate his love for us, then those love relationships in our lives, our wives, our husbands, our children, will be what they're supposed to be. Our relationship with one another in the church, loving brothers and sisters in Christ, loving a lost world, will never be what they're supposed to be if we don't love God first, if we don't reciprocate his love. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you know why churches fight? You know why people get mad at one another in the church? Because their relationship with God is not right. It's not what it ought to be, so the relationship with one another won't be right. You know why husbands and wives fight and get in trouble and struggle with one another? Because their relationship with God is not right. When this relationship's right, these relationships will be right. And it all starts with God because why? He is love. And he is the standard of love. Now, here's John's exhortation to us in verse 11. Look at it. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, the if word in that verse is what's called a conditional clause. And it's not if, it's since. The, the meaning of the word if isn't questioning, saying, well, you know, if God did this, meaning maybe God did it, maybe he didn't. No, it's a conditional clause, and particularly in the Greek, it means since God did this. Since this is true, then this is true. That's a conditional clause. Well, what's he saying? Since God has first loved us, since God has done all these things, justified us, paid for our sin, and loved us unconditionally, then what he's saying, since God has done that, so we should do the same. We should love God selflessly. We should love the brethren selflessly. We should love the lost selflessly. What John's saying is since God has loved us that way, then we have what we might call an obligation to love others that way. Since God has demonstrated that to us, then we need to demonstrate that to others. I'll illustrate how this, how this works from a personal account. You may have heard the story. I pulled into Walmart one day, and I was going to run in and grab some stuff. And I don't know how you shop, but when I shop at a store, the Publix Buyer House or Walmart, I know where everything's at in the store. If they move the shelves and move stuff around, it really messes me up. Because <laughs> I can take the cart and go in on one side of the store, and I know what I want, and I can make a lap through the store and get it all on one lap, and then not, you know, and I do it quick. Sometimes Sherry will call me and I'll say, I already passed that aisle. You're out of luck. <laughs> you know, I, already, I already went by there. But because it's her, I have to go back and get it. <laughs> but I can, I can get what we want and not waste a lot of time. I can run in there, you know, make my lap around, grab all the stuff that I need and get out. Well, when I'm driving up there, you know, I know I got in my mind what I'm going to get. So I pull into this parking spot. And there was another guy who didn't park in the, his parking spot. He was like part in another parking lot. Don't you hate people do that, right? He's like not in his spot. So I parked right in the middle of my spot and got out and he leaned out the window and said, you're too close to my car. 
I had to make a choice. I'd drag him out the window of that car <laughs> or, you know, show him the love of Jesus, right? So I stood there and looked at him for a second. It was a young fellow. He's, a lot of people are younger than me now. I don't know how that works. But I looked at him. He was younger than me, and I, and I just turned around, went back, got in my car, moved over a spot, and got out and went in the store, mumbling to myself the whole way, right? So I go in the store, get my cart, and go about my business. You know, I'm going down my aisle, getting my stuff, and guess who I see coming from the other way? Mr. Can't park in the parking spot straight, right? So I see him coming, and he comes toward me. And I thought, all right, here we go. So he comes over to me, and he stops, and he goes, I really want to apologize for what I said in the parking lot. He said, uh, you know, I shouldn't have said that, and I'm sorry. Well, that was pretty nice. So I apologized to him for being angry and being too close to his car, and we went on our way. The point is, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me in the parking lot before I said or did anything that I would have been, had to confess later, I guess would be the way, best way to put that, right? And so I think by not responding negatively, you know, I guess the only thing more I could have done was walk over and share the gospel with him while he was being ugly. But, I, you know, I didn't really feel like it at the moment, to tell you the truth. But the point is, by, by allowing God to have me show kindness to the guy, even though he was being a knucklehead, it gave opportunity later to have an actual human interaction with them and an opportunity to demonstrate love of God. That's the shoe leather kind of stuff God wants us to do. And I'm not saying that to say I do it all the time because I could give you just as many of examples where I didn't walk away and told a guy he was a knucklehead, okay? So I'm saying, though, when, when we listen to God and we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, to, to convict us, and in the moment we respond correctly, God can use that. And what it's showing to people is the love of God. And listen to me. I'm going to give you three things as we finish up of why it's so important that, that verse 11, this obligation of God, since God has so loved us, should we not also love one another? Let me tell you three things why that's imperative that we do that. Number one, number one is God is glorified when we love other people like he loves us. That's the most important. When we love people in the church, the church, the church is edified. When we love one another in the body of Christ, Jesus is glorified because it's his church. And churches that fight with one another and fuss and members of churches and Christians who argue with one another are a terrible testimony and God's not glorified in that. And so when we love one another, Jesus is glorified. Number two, it brings unity in the body of believers. When we love one another selflessly, when we don't demand our personal rights, when we seek the best of others, we put others ahead of self, when we build up and edify, and listen, here's the biggie, when we forgive others for their wrongs, the church is built up and edified. I don't know about you, and I, I share, I'm, I'm just know that I'm as human as you are. If people are mean and ugly, and they offend me, and they hurt my family, or they attack me, I don't have a literal index, but in my mind and in my heart, there's a little card that goes in with a red flag on it, right? And says, okay, that person, that person's on my naughty list, all right? And that person, you know, they've been mean, they've been upset, and they've been, they've been mad at me, or they've been hurt my family. And listen, the love of Jesus Christ says you don't keep anything like that, that you forgive, and that you say, listen, no matter what a person does, I have to love them like Jesus loved me. Now, why? Would you admit that we have offended Jesus? Would you admit that Jesus could have the little cards with the flag on them for us and go, you know, among all them lost people down there, Robert really ticks me off. And so I'm going to put a little, I'm going to put a little red flag on his card because he really is bugging me. Could not Jesus do that? Sure he could. We've all offended Jesus. We've all offended God with our sin, but God doesn't remember wrongs. In fact, here's the great news. When we get saved and God forgives our sin, he puts our sin as far as the east is from the west. Puts it in the deepest ocean, and he don't go back and look at it. One little kid in Sunday school, he puts up a no fishing sign. Listen, our sin, God completely removes it. God does not hold a grudge. So neither should we, because the unity of the church depends on it. And finally, evangelism. Evangelism is most effective when we love like Jesus. 
can't share the gospel with somebody you're mad at. I just told you that. You know, the guy's in the car, he's ticked me off, and now, now, now I, 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 the Holy Spirit's going, you really need to tell him about Jesus. And I'm like, uh, okay, maybe later, because right now he's being an ugly head. No, when we love like Jesus loves, when we love people regardless of what they do, they think that's weird. I mean, people look at the church and they go, look at all them people. They get along. They actually like one another. And the world goes, what is it you guys got? What is it you got that's going on? What's going on in your life? What's going on in that church that everybody does the ministry and seems like they're having a good time and they're singing and praising and they're enjoying one another? Why? Well, yeah, because the Holy Spirit's doing a supernatural thing and helping us love one another like we're supposed to. We don't do that. It's produced by the Holy Spirit, which, again, is an evidence of being saved. Well, let me close with this. If you take inventory in your life, as I was forced to do this week while I'm writing this, you take an inventory in your life and figure out, man, am I loving like I should? Am I, am I really loving God like I should, reciprocating his love? Am I loving the body of Christ like I should? Am I loving lost people? Am I loving those who are unlovable? There's a lot of people in the world that are hard to love. Are we loving the unlovable? Are we caring about them? Are we having compassion for them? Here's the last thing I'll say. You know, sometimes, sometimes people just have a bad day, don't they? You probably never have a bad day, but sometimes people have a bad day. And sometimes people are just not at their best. And it, it probably is in those times that we really need to be at our best with Jesus, that we need to love them because they're having a bad time. And maybe it'll be our love for them and the love of God through us for them that'll help them have a better day that will encourage them and help them through whatever difficulty they're going through. The love of God. God is love. Do you see the evidence of that in your life? Do you see God producing that in your life? If not, would you do this, would you do this this morning? Would you come to Jesus today confessing your sin? Would you ask him to forgive you and save you? Would you give your heart to Jesus? Ask him to be your Lord. If you'll confess your sin and ask him, he'll save you right now. He'll remove your sin. He'll put on you his righteousness. We do that today. Let's pray. Father, this, this passage is really right where we live. God, the world is so hard and wicked and difficult and so antithetical to love and, and compassion. But yet, God, it is in that world that you called us to be a light shining in the darkness because you are light. You called us to love people because you have first loved us. You are love. God, help us to do that, Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts. Help us.